NYC Apartment Zone, NYCApartmentZone.com. From New York City, this is the NYC Zone Teams Podcast, a show where we discuss everything about New York City real estate and much more. You have questions, we have answers. And now, here are your hosts, John and Nikolai. All right, so we are here with another episode with the NYC Zone Team, here with my business partner, Nikolai, John here, and I want to give a special thank you to you guys. We have a great uh, panel here of guests. We have Leonard Steinberg. Uh, Chief Evangelist uh, from Compass, uh, Andrew Feldman, uh, who has an extensive background in commercial real estate, and uh, the famous Brian Lewis, who's, uh, I love your videos, man. <laughs> I'll take famous. I think I'd rather have evangelist. That's pretty awesome, too. I'll take infamous. There you yeah. go. There you go. Um, I want to thank you guys for coming by today. Um, I think we have a really great topic, which is what is going on in the real estate market right now. Um, I'm just going to just run by some numbers right now with you, with you guys really quick, um, just so you kind of get a scope of what's going on right here. In Manhattan alone, we're showing that uh, there's about 7,200 units of supply that's actually including uh, new development and resell. That's 23% higher than last year. Uh, we're showing an uptick on days on market on average, around 87 days, which is about 24% uh, higher versus last year. Uh, we are also showing a monthly absorption rate of 5.7, which is uh, about 24% higher than last year. So we're close to six months of inventory. Uh, this is, I find this to be quite interesting. The median listing discount is about 4.2%, and that's 55% higher than last year. Um, sales over asking price is only 19%, which is below 24% versus last year, so not a lot of things are going over asking. And I thought this was pretty interesting too, off-market units has gone high around 46% versus last year. We're showing up a total off-market inventory of around 4,397 units. Um, that's, one of, that's the numbers. Um, a lot of things that are going on, like such as the New York Times, Manhattan buyer's market widens, the Business Insider, Manhattan home sales plunge as sellers re, uh, refuse to get quote unquote realistic about what buyers can afford. Bloomberg is saying Manhattan home sales tumble in a market clogged with listings. And CNBC was saying Manhattan real estate is now in a year long correction. Wah. Wah. <laughs> and we're done. <laughs> so much fun, guys. So, with, love it. I guess the real question is, is what in the world is going on? Well, I think what we're seeing is uh, a realization of a shifting market many, many months after it started. So if you look at the um, data that's coming out, most of it is being broadcast now that's believable because it's being written by the press. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes that data is heavily delayed. We saw this shift happening many, many months ago. It has been reported in recent weeks, but we saw it happening a long, long time ago. I would say the shift started 18 to 24 months ago. And my feeling is, in a big way, it was the threat of rising interest rates combined with what I call luxflation, which is the extreme elevating of prices in the luxury markets that's unsustainable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we're done again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things I... I um, I've, I love when the press starts writing about something mm -hmm. because I don't have to talk as much right. and someone else's words are there because I have had a hoarse voice literally for about a year and I know how to use my voice, but I, I literally carry this throat spray around right here. I wish this was television <laughs> because I have to lubricate my voice because I'm always telling the same story. It's in a different way and you always have to gauge your audience because we're in sales and they have to like you, but you, you owe it to them to be honest. And I always say, what you're about to hear from me is coming from honest guy. I'm not selling you anything. I want you to hire me, but I only want you to hire me if you are going to be in touch with what the market is. Because the market does not need another overpriced listing. It just doesn't. Right. And I had been saying that at least a year ago. And then in June, July, Personally, in the markets that I work day in, day out, um, I noticed it really going. Uh, I felt like the skiers that were on that slope 
were really feeling some uneasy terrain. I won't call it an avalanche, but I felt it. So I say that my sellers right now have more perspective on what has been happening in the past 12 to 18 months. They have the best seat in the house to watch it. The press is writing about it. I've talked about it until I'm hoarse. And now their neighbor who tried to do what they want to do now was on that little avalanche this summer. And for me, in my markets, it was June, July. I felt a, a, a very strong 10%, at least, at least, and a broker I admire quite a bit said to me the other day, quit saying your 10% story. Say 20, it's more honest. Um, but I, I, it's, it's a fine line because you have to broker your sellers first, get them in reality, but not let them think you're Debbie Downer, wet blanket, oh, there's that guy with the old dark story and the rough voice. No, you have to, the show, quote unquote, yeah. begins when you begin your marketing. But boy, they said, what can we do to make your, make our place separate from the pack? Make it gorgeous, make it irresistible. Compass will take care of everything else. We're good at that. We'll market the heck out of it. But you and only you are in charge of that price. You're driving the car and I'm your GPS. If I tell you to take a right and you take a left, I'm still going to get you there. You're just going to hate me at the end of the process because they're going to forget that it was their idea. And they'll go to a party and they'll tell a story and they'll forget the part where they say, and it was my idea and Brian told me not to do it and he did. And then I'll leave this, I'm hogging this mic, I apologize. I love being wrong. I love it because when I'm wrong, we all make more money, including the seller and most importantly the seller. But we are boots on the ground in many neighborhoods, in many boroughs, at many price points, treating them all like uber luxury. So we know, we know a few things. So I, 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 I say that's, I've been feeling it 12 to, to 18 months and it's a relief that they're writing about it now. Right. Yeah, I think it's something that we have been seeing on our end too about uh, two years ago uh, when we were telling people about it. The way the conversation has gone has changed completely. Before we were having discussion, this can be sold within the first 30 or 60 days. Mm -hmm. Right now, the narrative is completely different. We're talking about longer days in market. And I believe you send out an email where we kind of make promises to people. And um, I think it's important to tell the sellers that it might change a couple of months from now. The pricing might have to be adjusted. Mm -hmm. Andrew, what are you telling your sellers? You know, I have a saying that's become my saying. Is I'm, I don't want to be right, I want to be rich. And the problem is, is that when I'm telling people the reality of the situations, this is the reality of it. Um, and I'm proven to be right, it costs everybody money. Myself, and my clients. And I think that a lot of these stories are exaggerated as a result of just not facing the reality. We wouldn't be talking about such drastic price drop figures mm -hmm. if people were pricing in accordance to what us as the boots on the ground, the soldiers, so to speak, the front line, are reporting back as the data. Right. I mean, th it, there's a level of disconnect, and I, one of the reasons why I joined Compass, and I second that we are going to take care of everything, suit to nuts, and it's up to the client to decide the pricing. But the reason why I joined Compass is because of just the understanding that there's a disconnect between clients and brokers, and we are not trusted, our information is not as held in high regard as like a doctor's advice or an attorney's advice. And that's systemically an issue in our industry. And we're supposed to be the professionals and our word is supposed to be trusted. And if our clients are not believing us, then there's a problem with the industry. And there's a problem with how we're viewed. And I think that Compass is beginning to change that perception of what a broker's job is. And that's gonna start changing these news stories. Now personally, I feel that it's not as bad as people think. It's not this horrible buyer's market. It seems like a buyer's market because everything is overpriced because people are getting bad advice. We're not listening to good. So there, there's a systemic issue there that's causing this to be more news than it really needs to be. I mean, the supply is 7,200. Practically 7,200. It's highest since almost 10 years ago. Well, Bloomberg said it beautifully. He said, if you want housing to be more affordable, build lots. <laughs> right. That's really how it works. If you wanted to go to Union Square today mm -hmm. and buy apples cheap, this is the time to do it because there are a lot of apples out there. Exactly. But I think this is a historical moment for us in real estate because I think for the first time in the luxury markets, 
we are experiencing a very, uh, you know, downwardly pressured luxury market at a time when the consumer is wealthier than at any other time in history, except for one little detail. There hasn't been a major equity markets correction, except for one annoying little detail that the uh, good bulk of the S&P 500 stocks gains are attributable to 10 stocks. Mm -hmm. So what about the other 490? True. And a lot of them are deeply depressed. Even if you look at our competitors in the real estate sphere, several of them are down 30 and 40 percent. That would be considered a depression if that were to happen market-wide. So we are definitely seeing the effects of luxflation. We're seeing the effects of rising interest rates. We're also seeing the effects of a global uncertainty around trade wars and tariffs. Inflation that everyone tells us is 2% that we are certain, based on our spending habits, is much higher, mm -hmm. especially in bigger cities. Yep. Yep. I mean, maybe it's 2% on average, but that also goes back to the bigger problem we have in real estate. Averages are very unreliable. Right. And we've been basing a lot of our data on averages, and then all of a sudden you get a headline written about a penthouse at 11 North Moore Street that had a discount of, what, 50%? Yeah. But that asking price was outrageous even when it came out in the best market imaginable but that's the sale that will make the headline on the way down just the way that one unique item that sells for this crazy price in an up market yep. makes the headline on the way up that that's sense? a problem because we look at that and then all of a sudden that seller comes next and says well they got that price then surely I should get that too and all of a sudden you list something for 15% more than the last sale and it doesn't make any sense and then someone pays it yeah, true. I mean, twenty eighteen was a pretty interesting year with real estate. I think it's. I think it's, it's not er over yet. It's not over yet. Not <laughs> over yet. But a lot of things are are obviously hitting the headlines and stuff. Um, and I was reading on the BBC news that the Federal Reserve is expected to raise three times next year in twenty nineteen, and actually one more time in twenty twenty. Where is it? What do you think this is leading us to? But things change quickly. Mm -hmm. We had an election yesterday. Yesterday. That's true. Now there's <laughs> friction. Now there's <laughs> friction. And I, will, I would say just some of the commentary that I've seen from the financial markets, and I'm no financial wizard at all, mm -hmm. but some of the com commentary I have seen is that that could temper the growth rates a little bit, not make it go to zero, but temper it a bit. And in doing so, may reduce the Fed's desire for raising rates as aggressively as they have recently. Right. But you just see how one day can change everything. So who knows? We don't know that answer for sure. There is an argument to be made that if the economy is so strong and inflation isn't out of control, why should we raise interest rates so aggressively? And that could, that could help us. I mean, going back from the election, it looks like the Democrats are, have uh, the majority of the House now and the Republicans have the majority of the Senate. So kind of like, I guess 50-50 on everything. The Dow's are showing that they're going up. So yeah, going, kind of going off of what you said, it could just change in an instant just uh, after, this, uh, after this election um, that people I guess, might change their views on buying. I mean, are you, are, you, are you telling your buyers anything? Well, I am. I tell my buyers who are interest rate sensitive right. that you're still uniquely low. I mean, the, market, the, the, the rates have gone up, but you still have very historically low rates. Mm -hmm. And before yesterday's election, people were saying they're just going to go up. So it's a unique moment, and the buyers that were sitting on the sidelines watching prices come down mm -hmm. love that feeling. Yep. But if they wait too long and the interest rate were to go up, that where's that savings? So you buy it because of your life's need. And the people that I deal with a lot aren't necessarily always third and fourth home people. Mm -hmm. They're often first home, uh, second home if they're lucky, uh, third home if they're really lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm dealing with the real New Yorkers who are really here. They're buying and selling because of births and graduations and marriages. And, uh, and they're selling because of births and graduations. Yeah. These are the reasons people do it. And on the other side of that, divorces and death. The, the normal stuff. The uber lux market. I have had a finger in it. I had a great closing this year for $42 million. But even that was because of good old fashioned, roll up your sleeves, price it right, market it smartly. It wasn't luck. 
It really was good old fashioned brokering. One of the things that I think happens in a changing market is that bro it shakes out the fat in our industry a bit. And I think that having done this for a while, 19 years is not, is not new. Um, and I've seen a few cycles. You, your credibility when you speak to a seller, you have a few battle scars and you have a few you know, ribbons on your lapel. So you have a little bit more credibility perhaps. Doesn't mean new people don't, they do. Um, but it, it, it does, you feel like you're a little more trusted. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I wanted to go with that. Okay. And yeah. that actually brings up an interesting question. We were at an appointment with a seller recently and uh, usually we see seven to 10 year cycles in real estate uh, from what I know so far. And uh, the seller said, you know, we can hold off, but we don't want to hold off three, five years. We can hold off possibly for a year. And since you guys are here, what would you advise us to do? Would you advise us to sell now? Would you advise us to, you know, rent it out for a year and sell after? Where would you suggest being? And I feel like we probably will get very unique opinions here. My crystal ball has been in the shop all of my life. Mm -hmm. So like Leonard, to Leonard's point yesterday, one day can change everything. Yep. My advice in today's market, if I would have advised to hold for a year, could have changed yesterday. I don't, I don't like those games. Yep. What I like to do is I like to sit down and figure out what the client's real true need is. Mm -hmm. you know, is this going to work for you today? And if it's not going to work for you today and you want to roll the dice and wait a year and see if it'll work better for you in a year, here is the information, here is the data, here is varying opinions and you are in control. You have to make that life decision. I can't, you know, my job as a broker, I don't want to guide in that way. What I want to guide and what I should be trusted more in is the strategy once they make the decision for their, for their own personal life and their own personal property. And people have very short-term memories to piggyback to the previous topic of interest rates. I mean, I, I've lived in this city all my life. I look young, but I'm 40 years old. I know, I know, I'm, still, I know I'm still a pop. That's I'm young. waiting. I, I knew. That's why I said to both of you guys, I was waiting. Why are you looking at me? I'm a pop. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm, I'm a pop. pop. <laughs> we'll teach you some new tricks. Uh, he knows. So, but people have short-term memories. I mean, these historically low interest rates, even with three increases, were still going to be historically low. It's, it's ridiculously low. And the reason why I say that people have a short-term memory is because when my family started investing in real estate, my father was buying real estate at 16% interest and still managing to make money and make deals. So how there's such a hyper-focus on going from three and three-quarter percent to four and a half percent, if that's going to really be changing lives that much, then there's a whole different conversation <laughs> that needs to be being well, there's a, there's a close It's a generational place. entitlement. Right. Because people feel that they're, we're addicted to it. Right. right. We all are. Well, it's the new norm. And we're all linear thinking creatures. And we're, you know, we always want it to never end, but it, it does end and it does change. And it doesn't mean that there's not opportunities when things change. Uh, a client that's asking, should I do it now or should I do it in a year? Uh, I mean, that question is best suited, you know, for them to, to speak internally and decide whether or not they're willing to gamble or take what's on the table right now. Because waiting a year, things change in a New York minute. Anything can, can vary. I also think the biggest mistake people make in transacting is looking at it as just one transaction. Uh, if you are running a company, you've got to look at a balance sheet, you should do the same thing with your real estate. You may take a loss on one transaction and compensate for it elsewhere at another time. And people don't like looking at the big picture, and I think that's a role we have to play in this equation. But I do think, and I really believe this, that we are in a very unique buyer's market moment. I don't know how long it lasts, I don't know if it keeps getting better or worse. But I think you have several factors on the table right now that are extraordinary for buyers. Number one, if you want to upgrade an apartment today, if you need more space and you're selling a million dollar apartment and there's a 20% discount, you've lost $200,000, but your $4 million apartment will save you $800,000. That's a great balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Number two, you have choice. Number three, you have time. You don't have a gun at your head to make decisions so you can actually do it calmly, selectively, cautiously and wisely then you do have interest rates that are still historically low, but more importantly than all of that, people will say, well, I'm going to wait for this great recession to come when I will be able to buy a bargain. Firstly, the best properties owned by wealthier people are removed from the market in a recession, number one. Number two, there are hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars on standby right now, 
created by small, medium, and large funds to buy up distressed real estate. You'll be competing against them. Number three, interest rates are still historically low, but more importantly, financing is available, readily available, and even though interest rates are creeping up, you can actually negotiate with banks now because they're desperate to make loans because there aren't as many loans being made. True. So you put those factors together and you have reduced asking prices and you have the capacity to negotiate and I would call that the ultimate buyer's market. Yep. I agree. I agree. And we're actually showing um, lots of activity uh, for condos and co-ops um, in, in different areas of what's going on here. The, what's selling the most right now, what's currently in contract for October's activity, we're showing that uh, for, let me see here, the hottest neighborhood is actually all Midtown uh, for condos. They're up 31%. Cheapy, cheapy, cheapy. Yeah. All Midtown. Uh, next to that one is the Upper West Side. 60%. Yay. Long residence. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> we had two bidding wars in the past two weeks. There you go. But the, we would not have achieved it if we had let the seller price where they wanted to price. And we're not always right, but it was a nice feeling. Yeah. And it, it, it's a good story to tell because it's not all doom and gloom. There's a way to take advantage of this buyer's market, to Leonard's point. Price it right. Price it right. That's Especially if it's a crowd pleaser. Right. That's, that's actually interesting. I was looking for one of my buyers at the property and I sent it over to him through the Compass platform and he was yes. like, this might be the winner. It was a duplex with outdoor space priced at nine ninety nine. So I called the broker. She's like, it's, um, we have an offer much above us. I was like, 1.1? She's like, no, still much above that. So even though we're in the buyer's market, we're still seeing certain properties that are sure. right going much above. Yeah, another thing that we did notice here is uh, units that are around five to ten million dollar range. Uh, the Upper West Side has the highest. Well, no, actually downtown does, but Upper West Side is second to highest at twenty seven percent, just showing fourteen already in contract in October. Downtown is actually the highest at fifty five percent higher. Um, so in in that market, five to ten million, there's a lot of activity going on in those two areas, and ten million and above, we're showing. Um, Midtown, 50% higher versus last year. Well, I have seen some transactions happen recently where what excites me most for the buyer mm -hmm. is, firstly for the seller, a lot of these people did pay a lot less than the selling prices to begin with. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them are making a rather extraordinary profit still. Maybe not as much as they would have two years ago, mm -hmm. but pretty extraordinary profits. But what excites me most is that I think we've reached an equilibrium point where the replacement cost is higher than some of the sale prices. Mm -hmm. And in that you can see intrinsic value. Now you throw in tariffs on steel and lumber, you see rising wages and higher inflation, and you can be certain the cycle for building right now is probably coming to a close because people just don't want to spend, you know, banks aren't going to want to finance these projects. For that cycle to get restarted can take years. In that moment, with all these escalated building costs, lies a tremendous upside potential. Because I just finished building a house, and I know that if I were to build a house today, it would cost me probably around 12 to 15 percent more. They keep telling me inflation's 2 percent. <laughs> it's 15 percent if you're building. True. In that lies incredible opportunity for buyers. And we see it, and we see it, and we try to tell this to uh, to buyers. Um, but I think the biggest frustration is with sellers, and of course, like kind of what you said, Brian, uh, you got to price it right. But sometimes when you feel like when you do the comps nowadays, where's the price? You know, you kind of have to like comps out of the window. Right. Well, that's it. And and I love, love, love. I love the the bandwagon that you're on. I love it. It's a broker's market. It's not a buyer's market. It's a broker's market. That's what I say. But my interpretation of what you say so elegantly is we have to share. We have to share this information because this market is an immediate market. Mm -hmm. And when you're reading in the papers about something, my, my pitch today that I came to right before the presentation I made, mm -hmm. she said, but my neighbor just closed in August. I said, I, I care more about when they've contracted. When did the transaction, meeting of the minds, ink to paper happen before the summer slide? Mm -hmm. They would fail to achieve that today. Value in the market. So it really matters to the sharing of information. I used to be one of those agents 
when I got a call from a broker and they asked me what the contract price was, I did my good revenue thing and I said, I'm protecting my seller, I will disclose that at closing. I've changed my tune on that because the old thinking was, well, they'll know what my seller took. You know what? We have to share information. Internally. Internally. Mm -hmm. And with, you don't broadcast it, but right. if someone calls me and I know them and I've, I share it, I do. Well, they I think we have that. to get to a point, this industry has to get to the point of signed contract data. If we don't have signed contract data, we're operating in the dark because the results of the articles, they were based on data, a lot of which had been signed 6, 12, 18 months before. Yep. How would you today enter the equity markets if someone said, you want to buy some Apple stock? Well, we'll tell you what it traded for 18 <laughs> months ago. You'd slap them in the face. Of course. Or you'd be in jail. Mm -hmm. So yes, we really have to get to a point now where the data actually has real value for the consumer because the consumer in many ways operates in the dark. And as agents, the very, little, the very least we could do for them is have the data internally to be able to share with them to help them make smart decisions. Right educated decisions based on fact. Exactly. Until we have really clean data, the consumer is not being well served. It's hard, it's hard because we had um, this one seller, uh, one bedroom, we priced it at 600,000. We then dropped it down to 575. We got in an offer, which I won't say because it's still going on. And later on we found out that a very close competitor to that specific unit Dropped their price from like 580 all the way down to 525. It just destroyed everything. Yeah. Everything. It's a race to the bottom. So it's just kind of like, so I feel like a lot of sellers now, they, they're saying like, well, we don't really trust what you're saying. It's not really what's about us. It's, it's you know, it's kind of like what you were saying, Andrew. It's like people are just, they're losing trust, you know? And it's just, we don't understand this is the data we're telling this how it was before, but now it's showing a different trend. Now your competition, which is 21 bedrooms that are in the area, they're going to 525, 535 now, and we're at 575. Like, but they're not content with that. And then you have other brokers coming in saying, don't worry, we'll sell it for higher. I think it just creates a confusion in the marketplace right now. Well, I think you have lux inflation and you have lux deflation. Right. And oftentimes it is exaggerated going up and exaggerated going down and then it finds its equilibrium. Right. Um, I wanted to talk to you, Andrew, in regards to the commercial side. What are you seeing in regards to retail, office? Like, what are you, what are you uh, seeing? How long do you got? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're seeing the similar things. It's not so different between our two ends of the business. Uh, we're still having the same kind of conversations. I mean, my, again, I have a lot of famous Andrewisms, mm -hmm. uh, catching the falling knife. I mean, that's probably the most frequent conversation that I'm having with any kind of commercial product that I'm working on, whether it be tenant rep, landlord rep, building sales, and even in the residential end when I do some residential. And, you know, the one thing that we want to avoid is the catching the falling knife. You know, we don't want to have to keep reducing pricing, trying to catch till we finally get to the point. It's, it's just poor way to go about it. Um, in commercial, in the new development aspect is drying up, and it's drying up for a multitude of reasons. Uh, we don't have the 421A benefits anymore, we have a higher taxation rate, there's less benefits, more tenant rights, I mean, all of these things are factoring into it. One of the reasons why my family got a New York City real estate was the liability of lead paint laws. I mean, these, these things are all playing a factor, but despite all of these roadblocks, there's still always been an opportunity to make money. Right now, the uncertainty in everything, and when I say everything, I mean everything, from governmental, local, federal, that was a big question mark. And that question mark led to more question marks, which then, of course, with the emotionally driven business, because we're all human, we all have emotion, mm -hmm. um, led to a hold off and let's see what happens, let's see how things shake out. Um, retail is dismal right now. You cannot walk down a block in Manhattan and see a vacant retail. You can't. It's impossible. Um, and we have a catching and folding knife with a lot of the landlords. The majority of the reason that we have so much vacancy in retail is because 
it's not as business friendly in New York City anymore. Uh, it's very difficult to um, convince someone to invest an obscene amount of money into a retail space when there is a vacancy across the street, right, right. next door, up the block, mm -hmm. down that side street. It, it's, it's very difficult. The, the big expense of a retail store is not even the rent. It's the renovation. Let us don't pick up any of this. They give you free rent, which is great because you don't want to be paying rent while you're renovating your store, but that doesn't really cover the cost. A restaurant in New York City right now, a 5,000 square foot restaurant, a high-end restaurant will cost you anywhere between three to five million to build it out and open the doors. Wow. Build it out and open the doors. Where do you think it's headed? I know you don't have a crystal ball. You made that evidence. Still in the shop. <laughs> no, I really have but but you, you have a perspective with your family, and I... I I say the same thing when people ask me where is it headed, but with Amazon, with the world as it is now, all the developers still build their commercial facing the avenues yeah. because they want that retail. Yeah. It, but what I love, yes. what I love, yes. when you speak about Amazon, look how Amazon makes an announcement and all of a sudden you say, Long oh, Island City. 25,000 people, <laughs> right. what's gonna happen? Yeah. 25,000 people working here, living, what's happening? Mm -hmm. And then you look at Amazon, which is supposedly the, uh, the death knell of retail opening up retail stores. Right. So things changed like That's that. That's right. It just redefines. But the key is, the key to me is with retail, commercial, residential, you have to evolve and you have to innovate. I think there was a time um, until recently where you could sell a 15, 20 million dollar apartment easily in a building with no amenities. All of a sudden now, that consumer expects a wave of services that you cannot compete with. So I hate to call it fashion, but I think there are fashions that come along and the evolution is maybe the better word for it, but you are seeing evolution happening at retail, evolution happening digitally, evolution happening in residential, okay. everywhere. Look at commercial. We as a company at Compass have a huge problem in that we wish we could have much larger floor plates, single floor plates. So what are they doing? They're building in Hudson Yards massive single floor plates and they're all getting rented up. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so there you have the answer, the evolutionary mm -hmm. real estate solutions get the audience. Mm -hmm. It's very true. I, I mean, I love the topic of retail is dead. It's my favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> it really it's is. That's how you make a living. Like, I get so excited, <laughs> my eyes light up, they get double the size. Because retail isn't dead. Get a haircut oh. on Amazon. Yeah. I tried. <laughs> Look at the result. It, it was a falling knife. Um, <laughs> yeah, it did. It did. <laughs> I, I mean, maybe one day that'll that'll happen. But the fact is, is it's just changed. And the reason why that this is a topic is because human beings as a whole have a very difficult time with change. We get very stuck in our bubble and very stuck in the way that things are done. And as soon as things change even a little bit. It's, it's doomsday, but it's not going out of business. The reason why we have so much vacancy has really nothing to do with an Amazon. Amazon isn't new, neither is eBay, neither is online shopping. I, I grew up with AOL. I remember, I remember you've got online. mail. <laughs> you've got mail. I still got mail. <laughs> uh, I did too. I mean, did I say that? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, mean, I, I grew up with AOL. This was the birth of internet, right? right? And the, the online exposure, and I was, young guy then, sort of, <laughs> and um, it, it just, it, it's evolved, but it, it's not, this is not a new occurrence, this is not a new technology that all of a sudden is changing the scape, the only thing that's changing is what the needs of the consumer are, and in this case, when we're talking about retail and office and commercial real estate, the consumer is the business owner, and the problem is, is that we have landlords that are stuck in their bubble. They're not willing to go outside of what they've been doing for the last 20 years that works for them and accepting the fact that this is no longer going to work. And maybe it's temporary, maybe it's the next five years, maybe it's the next two years, maybe this is the new landscape. Mm -hmm. But either way, you need to just accept the fact that this is what it is. Lots of inherited landowners as well as a problem because they're just used to a model from the past and they're not adapting to the future. If you That's look at this, I mean, if you look at technology, which in many ways people blame for having destroyed retail, 
And then you look at those that have embraced technology within retail. I mean, you go to Bonobos. Is that how you said Bonobos? I think so. Bonobos. Yes. And I love that um, model where you go and you try and you jack, you pick that, that, then you go like, bye-bye, and it gets shipped to you. That's the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. So just like I think where Compass combines high-tech and high-touch, I think retail that does the same is going to have a huge future. I think, look what Restoration Hardware is doing. Yes, that, that was actually my point. I actually got a huge magazine in my in my mailbox recently and it opens up with a letter from the CEO of the company saying that it's not dead, it's just evolving. Look at our spaces, our spaces are completely different. You don't just walk in and see a sofa there. You can feel it, you can touch it, it's completely different. It's an experience. And it makes a competition which brings a better product for the end consumer. And I feel like it's happening the same thing in real estate. People that provide in the best marketing, the best tools, the best sources, the best information are the ones that are going to be staying alive. And That's why I came to Compass. <laughs> really, move quickly, learn from reality. Yeah. I think I got that right. <laughs> those are two, yes. two of those. Um, and one of my favorite quotes, and I'll bastardize it, sorry. Wayne Gretzky said he wasn't a great hockey player. And he said, but his trick, his skill was, he went where the puck was going mm -hmm. while everybody else went to where the puck was. Mm -hmm. So I try to tell that to my sellers, my buyers, my life. Mm -hmm. Where's the next, where's it moving? Where are we moving it? And I think Compass is moving it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're moving the needle. We're not letting it move us. But we will, we adapt, we change. I love the floor plate story in Hudson Yards because that is, interesting, yeah. they're, they're thriving. Makes sense. They're right. thriving because they know what people want. They know where the, the hockey puck, I'll kill that analogy, is going. <laughs> but quality of life as well. Let's look at restoration hardware again. In the bad old days, buying furniture was disgusting. Yes. Number one, delivery sucked. Mm -hmm. Choice was awful. You couldn't experience it. You didn't have a wide variety of choice. All of a sudden, you go to the restoration hardware store in Beverly Hills or Greenwich, or you go in um, the meatpacking district now. You have a wonderful lunch. You go downstairs. You sit at the, in the sofa, and they bring you fabric, and you have a glass of, you know, a cup of cappuccino. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it's become an experience and an enjoyable moment. In the past, retail had become a accountant's like monster where they're like, let's get rid of this person, let's get rid of that person. Mm -hmm. Dollars per square foot, dollars per square foot, dollars per square foot. And then all of a sudden, people walked in and they said, I'm being treated like an idiot here. I'm getting nothing out of this retail experience. Now they go elsewhere. But you do go, I mean, I have a client and she always says, I go for quality. So we were coming from a showing up on 96th Street. Well, not quite. She wouldn't look there. Um, but she was coming all the way from uptown and we're heading out and it just started to rain. And she said, oh, I need a raincoat. So she picked up the phone, called her um, salesperson at Boat of Goodman. Mm -hmm. And she hung up the phone and I was like, oh my God, you're buying a raincoat on a whim at Boat of Goodman. I said, isn't that a bit extravagant? We could have stopped over at H&M or some other place and gotten you a raincoat for like a hundred bucks. And she said, lied. Number one, this lady knows exactly what raincoat is going to work on me. The color, the fit, the size, everything. She will be standing on the corner of 57 and 58th Street with a box and hand me my raincoat. It'll be perfection. It'll cost $2,000, $1,900 more than any other one. Mm -hmm. But in the time I'm going to save by not going into a store, trying to find what works for me, that time saved alone. Mm -hmm. The aggravation and annoyance, I'll never be able to get back in my lifetime. And chances are, with the kind of work I do, I'll make more money in that time than I would have had I spent it at Bogdoms. And that raincoat will last me 10 years. Right. That is a story that every retailer, every real estate agent, and everyone in commerce should pay close attention to. Because there are people, and especially the people we deal with who are wealthier, for the most part, even they're buying a $300,000 property, they're wealthy in the big scheme of things. Yes, right. We have to take care of them in that manner. And if we listen to that, and we understand just how valuable their time is, and we adapt to the changing world, we'll be fine. But if we want to repeat the mistakes of the past, we'll just repeat that which worked in the past, we have a problem. Right, it's, I think it's completely evolving, and I think retailers are trying to find that. I think you were telling me a story about uh, Casper, the bed, how they were, um, they're realizing now they need some stores because people actually wanted to feel the beds. I Instead love their ads. I love their campaign. Dude <laughs> on a bike, want to meet him. Carrying a mattress, want to meet him. Um, but I want to know what, how it's going to feel. Like exactly. you got to go feel it. Yeah, you want to go feel the bed and everything. Right yeah. That's going to always be the, the want. I mean, I know my size. I can go online and I could pick out a Burberry this or that, whatever. And I know how it's going to fit me because I own it. 
right. but the experience of going in and actually touching the fabric right. and making sure it falls right. And I don't care how easy you make returns. I still have to put it in a box, <laughs> put the label on it, Pain in the butt. bring it to a store. Yep. Right. You, can't, you yep. can't simplify that for me. No. Yep. It's the same as going to the store. So the online presence, although it is important, and of course, a lot of big retailers like Saks and Bloomingdale's, they're suffering. If it wasn't for their off locations, their outlet style locations, mm -hmm. all of their large locations would be closed. It's the off locations that are supporting the big box retail brand. But it's interesting though, when you think of a very old fashioned brand like Nordstrom's, mm -hmm. and they're one of the top 10 e-tailers in the world. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. There you see an old brand adapting to new times and more than likely they'll thrive. They're listening. Yeah. And it's the same thing that's happening in, in commercial. I mean, we have a vacancy rate in office, for instance, about 9%. Historically, a little on the higher side, but not astronomical. And everybody thinks that you're going to get this fantastic, amazing deal. The majority of the issue within um, the office world is the four and five star, the top tier. It's still priced too high, so we're catching a falling knife kind of pricing. But people are looking now for those services. Right. That's what they want. Exactly. The one and two and three star properties, the lower end properties, although they have the lowest amount of vacancy rate right now because they're the cheapest, mm -hmm. there's less demand for it now. People want the extra. And these older buildings that aren't going to start upgrading and changing and conforming to what is the need now, they're going to get lost, they're going to get left in the dust. Right. And the same thing is happening with retail, and the same thing is even translating into sales, in the building sales. Residential, multifamily properties are on buyer. We're already past the sales volume of last year. Mm. Wow. Already. And the year's not even over yet. Mm. The amount of transactions we've done is down dramatically. But the dollar value Tight. is up wow. overall. Office and retail is down, but multifamily is up astronomically. Right. Inflation. And, I, and I'm curious because uh, in, in, in commercial and also in residential, I mean, we're seeing some pretty interesting contingencies on people putting offers. Are you guys seeing contingencies? <laughs> the crazy contingencies. <laughs> okay. that, that, that's, that's one of the things. And another one, I feel like we've been discussing that there is so much opportunity on the buy and tenant side. And even though people are still dragging their feet, so what type of contingencies right. and do you see people still dragging their feet? On What's the wildest one you guys have seen? I don't know if it might have been so wild, but I had I had a buyer on a property. Are we allowed to say addresses on this? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> I, like, I, knew, I knew that the place he wanted was going to be in this building. It was a pre-war conversion. It was on the Upper East Side. It needed to be near a school. Mm -hmm. I'll say that much. Uh, they wanted a four or five bedroom. I knew the floor plates. I knew that one, two floors, or was it three floors above, uh, had just closed for eight million seven, I believe. Mm -hmm. That was in the spring, early spring. I got him a deal a few floors lower, looking on the treetops, exactly that apartment. I got him a contract closing price at 8.1%. I got a 4% buyer commission. I had all the closing costs paid. I had him reconfigure walls. When I say him, the seller, putting in pocket doors where there, there were none. That's, that's a removal of a wall and a rebuild because yes. they're thicker. So they, they think I got them a great deal and I think I got them a great deal. I was very proud of that. And we weren't cantankerous, we weren't entitled. We just asked because we knew there were more of them out there right. than there were of us. And we knew the metrics on what they had gotten, but we also knew that things had been changing. So there's unique opportunities for buyers. And I, I think my buyers were very thrilled with that. But as you were, this is fascinating to me, this commercial thing, because you were talking about how this is such a, a, a perfect storm for good value for buyers. Yep. But it's also whenever there's a changing market, it's a great opportunity to, to look internally at our own businesses and our own company's business to see where we can become and adjust the way Nordstrom has, the way Bergdorf provided for your buyer, et cetera. So I'm just speaking out loud because it's a, it's a wake up call for me. Sure. It's, it's a moment to go, there's opportunity here to redefine who you are mm -hmm. and what you are and to get better at what you do best and to, and to move your own needle yep. forward. And uh, I feel like from what we're seeing with retail, certain stores close in and we're seeing the similar thing with real estate agents. We 
heard from a person from uh, Rebney, we can disclose the name, but I think soon it's going to be public information that about 15% of agents, 10 to 15, have been leaving every year the industry for past two years. So the number of licensed agents is decreasing. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that always happens in a down market, but yep. I do believe what's happening is there are new standards being set in the consumer's mind. Yep. Do you remember, well, you don't remember this, but I remember a long, long time ago, electric windows in a car were a luxury. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you remember then when a GPS came into car, that was a luxury. Mm -hmm. Now, if you tell someone, I have a car with GPS and electric windows, they look at you like, so? Yes, you drive a Corolla? <laughs> 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 so this is a democratization of luxuries that is happening also in the hospitality industry. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you can get a $300 a night hotel room that's actually very nice. You can get great service in that hotel. Mm -hmm. And we as a service industry, because we are a service industry in brokerage, just as we are a service industry in how we provide retail and commercial space and residential space to people, that is a service in that we're providing. Mm -hmm. We have to look probably to the hospitality industry to see what they're doing because they are doing it really, really well. Oh yeah, they, I think they're pros. They have like... 100%. And it's about, it goes back to the human essence of business, right. that we are not doing business with machines, we're doing business with people. people. Yep. I think, and I think, I think that's where Compass understands where we're going. You know, everyone has this fear that Amazon or some other big tech company is going to take out the real estate agent from the equation. And the kind of like how... enhances experience. Right. It doesn't make right. It and kind of like how Robert said was, it's, it's still going to be a people to... Person to person yeah. transaction, you know, and it's very personal. It's very it's personal and very emotional. And too. even commercial is personal in it many is. ways. Yes. Oh, yeah. The whole business is really personal. Yeah. I mean, to think for a moment that we actually sell real estate is the biggest misinterpretation of what we do for a living, I believe. Because I can walk anybody into a $5 million apartment mm -hmm. and there's nothing I can say to convince them to buy it if they don't like it. How am I selling real estate? It's matchmaking. It's a match, exactly. Yeah, match I, can talk a a I can talk you into a pair of pants. I can talk you into a car, Bonobos, <laughs> or even a Bird Dolph Goodman jacket. But I can't talk you into, in, in essence, one of the largest purchases of your life, whether it be commercial or, or residential, irrelevant in fact. It's a lot of money. Yeah. What I sell is me. Mm -hmm. I sell me, I sell my service, I sell my expertise, I sell knowledge and guidance and hopefully trust. That's what I sell. And our service is what is, I guess, in, in this, in, in my opinion, in the way that the market is going right now, a lot of brokers have forgotten exactly what it is that we do. Mm. And that we need to go back to, with new technology, the old ways of a real estate broker. It was a very personal experience, not that long ago. And with all of the techs like Amazon coming in and the home, remember, it was like 2005, home of the 2% commission where you could sell your own home online. I forget the right. name. Right, Redfin. Right. They, they went out of business. And the reason why is because when you remove the human component from real estate, right. you remove the whole entire process from the component. 100%. From, from the I also think one message that we need to be sure we broadcast very boldly to the consumer as agents mm -hmm. is the fact that the services we provide are an advisory service over a lifetime, not just the facilitators of a transaction. We get paid at the time of transacting, but that actually might be very cheap when viewed over the context of 20, 30, 40 years of service. Mm -hmm. Because you might only transact two or three times, maybe even once or twice. And if you're only paying at the time of transacting, our fees, which are high, are actually quite cheap. It's true. It's true. I, I think, um, again, it's a very emotional process with the buyer or with the seller. Um, and I think it's really knowing how and other to... people, attorneys, yes. attorneys, yes. Yes. everyone, they, they, fellow they get brokers, brokers. <laughs> <laughs> getting everyone together, having everyone on the same page. It's, it's, it's a process. And so it's kind of like sometimes we, we talk about it, like, man, it's interesting how some people think they could do this on their own. If they have no idea, they don't do this every day. Like I, do. I think I can do it on my own. In fact, let me give you an example. I bought a piece of property upstate in Westchester. And I mm -hmm. said, you know what? I'm an agent. I've been doing this for 20 something years. I can do this on my own. And I started doing it on my own. And I thought, this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I just was crazy. And I have a friend who's an agent. And she was telling me, you need 
me to help you. I said, yeah. yes, okay, help me. Mm -hmm. the, what she showed me and taught me mm -hmm. in three weeks was more than I had learned in eight months. Right. Oh, I love it. And you save your time too. That's right. You know, the last luxury. I love that. Yeah. There's a guy named Bill Fisher who ran a, a, a real estate, excuse me, a travel agency for years. I know his daughter. When the internet became the internet and everybody started doing all of their deals online alone, like a FISBO mm -hmm. for travel, he removed his contact information from any printed source and he became a travel club. To get his phone number and his access and his email, you pay $100,000 just for the privilege. For that, you don't get free trips, but you get the most high touch service you can imagine in the travel industry. He serves on boards, the Four Seasons, etc. He travels the world, but his clients, if it's not snowing on Christmas Eve in Aspen, he will make sure that on Christmas Eve, you are moved to Switzerland to where it is snowing. And I'm being facetious, but that's the level of service and you can't get that online alone. You can't get the man to run out of Bergdorf and hand you a raincoat in a bag online. Yep. These are relationships, and I bet he's done that for her many times <laughs> because there's trust and there's it's relationships. It's true. It's the people. Yep. We're in a people and, business. But tech can be very helpful if tech sure. has accuracy. We as uh, agents of any have an extraordinary role in playing as editors, mm. where we have the capacity to edit out that which is pertinent and that which is useless. Oh, yeah. The consumer right now, on all levels, is overwhelmed with way too much inaccurate information. It's a tremendous disservice to them. It's actually a favor to us that there's all this bad information out there. Mm -hmm. Very true. Um, I think we kind of covered everything in regards to uh, the real estate market. And um, yeah. do you guys have any an idea where you think um, 2019 will lead us right now? I, I personally see 2019 as being pretty solid because ultimately real estate is very much reliant on economies. Right. And it appears to me that the economy will be pretty solid through 2019. The big one, of course, will be trade um, wars. If those get deeper, that could impact pricing right. and could stifle things. If there are trade agreements made, which I suspect there will be, yeah. Dealing with the known is always better than assuming the unknown because no one ever assumes the unknown is going to be good. Mm -hmm. They always assume the worst. Just the way when you look out of a window and you see an empty lot, it's better to see a raw construction site to know what's coming. Yep. So losing a view is one thing, but if you never thought you had the view in the first place, it doesn't matter. I think having some more clarity, I think being past the election, this mm -hmm. midterm I think helps tremendously. I think, so I think having maybe a bit of a tempering on extreme growth could actually be beneficial. But let's face it, our unemployment is extraordinarily low um, and we have a very solid economy and pricing has been adjusted mm -hmm. and interest rates are still historically low. Mm -hmm. I always focus on what we do know. We know of this long checklist of criteria that I think fuel for a healthy market. And any advice for agents that are experiencing this shift? <laughs> Trust the truth. Trust what's out there. Get good data from good sources. And I'll say it again. It's a broker's market. We need each other more than ever. We need honesty. We need good information, not fake news. We need, and we need to provide that service and we need to rise above it. Our behavior has to be better throughout the industry. We have to always acknowledge when we see really good behavior because I feel like the we're evolving, the industry is evolving, uh, and I, I'm, I'm excited to be part of that on the front lines every day. And we should self-regulate as an industry. We should self-regulate our behavior to be the best it can be. We don't need some outside force mm -hmm. or government entity coming into saying, do this, do that. We're grown-ups, we're professionals, and we should hold ourselves up to a much higher standard. And if we do that, the consumer benefits. If the consumer benefits, we have a future. That's right. Well, Leonard, Andrew, Brian, thank you so much for passing by. This was great. I really love this. And um, We have so many years of experience here. Yeah, we have so many years of experience, and we hope that everyone who's listening has learned something. And again, thanks so much, guys. Thank you. NYC Apartment Zone. NYCApartmentZone.com.